get started. Uh, can we settle down, please? Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Njodin Donyema. I shall be your session supervisor. Um, and this session is going to address the issue of the developmental state, uh, where we will have uh, Catherine uh, May Mayer in conversation with Elsie uh, Kanza. Um, I think we are in for a very exciting uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, if the keynote address by Mr. Arnold is anything to go by because we did grapple quite a lot um, with with this concept. Um, without any further ado, I'll give over to Catherine who will introduce um, our speaker. Okay, thank you everybody. I'm uh, very pleased to be here and to have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for today, uh, Elsie Kanza who is one of uh, Forbes' 20 youngest power women in Africa. So uh, it's really a, a pleasure to hear from people who are, are pulling together business, organization, leadership, um, and also recognizing that uh, young women in Africa are really on the move. Um, with the globalized profile of many young African professionals, um, Elsie fits very well. She's a a Tanzanian born uh, in Kenya, educated in the US and Kenya and the UK. Uh, she has a BA in International Bus Business Administration from the United States International University, Africa. She has a Master's of Science in Finance from the University of Strathclyde in the UK. And she has a Master's of Arts in Development Economics from Williams College, Massachusetts in the USA. So she has really um, mastered quite a lot uh, educationally and then went on to become uh, an Archbishop Desmond Tutu Leadership Fellow in 2008. Uh, she's gone on then to become World Economic Forum uh, World Leader in 2011 uh, and until recently has served as the personal assistant and economic advisor to uh, the President of the Republic of Tanzania. She now serves as the director for Africa at the World Economic Forum. I don't imagine I have to tell you what the World Economic Forum is. And through this position, her team has been focusing on addressing important issues in Africa, including climate change, um, food security, infrastructure development, and resource management. So a, a range of very uh, core issues in thinking about contemporary African development. And she is, I think, most usefully for this particular forum, a dedicated to promoting youth leadership in Africa. She particularly focuses on helping the World uh, Economic Forum's Shapers community, which consists of 20 to 30-year-olds working on development projects across Africa. So I have the great pleasure of presenting uh, Ms. Uh, Elsie Kanza to you, and I'd like to uh, say a, a couple of words to uh, move into her, her her speech, simply to point out that what we're talking about today, the developmental state in Africa and thinking about whether it has a role, it's useful to remember two things. One, that market and business-led development has had free reign in Africa for the last 30 or 40 years, and it's because of its failure that we're talking about the developmental state again today. We wouldn't be having this conversation if business and market alone were the solution. So we're really looking at you know, what's happening here. What's happening here and how do we get the best out of both? The second issue is that um, despite all of the talk of the failures of African states, their, their uh, poor performance, their corruption, there are stirrings of developmentalism across Africa in various places that deserve attention, not only to say, aha, something good is happening, but also to learn lessons to figure out the ways to move forward. So I would like to hand over to Elsie to hear how she sees these issues, and I look forward to a productive discussion after that. Thank you very much. I give you Elsie time. Thank you. Testing. Oh, that works. <laughs> 
So um, thank you very much, Kate, uh, for your uh, introduction. I appreciate it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to say all protocols observed, because I'm sure this is a, a mixed uh, audience. Allow me to begin by thanking the Oxford Africa Society for inviting me to address such an important uh, gathering and for their excellent arrangements. I'm honored to be here, and I'm grateful for the privilege. Um, as Kate mentioned, um, I've headed the Africa team at the forum for the past uh, five years or so, and before that was the focal point for the World Economic Forum uh, for the president of Tanzania for the previous uh, six years or so. So I have a history of, of the forum outside and inside for about 10 years. At the World Economic Forum, my team focuses on delivering on the forum's mission of improving the state of the world um, in the context of the region by accelerating Africa's growth and development transformation agenda. We're also directly responsible for managing the relationship between African governments and the forum. This includes heads of state and government, um, ministers, central bank governors, and heads of select national agencies. Indirectly, um, I'm responsible for curating the different stakeholders and activities. Uh, this is both at a, on a regional level, or in country, as well as the global community interested in Africa um, to ensure that somehow there's coherence in how they operate and that leads us to make progress on the overall strategy. Allow me to begin by declaring my interests. I'm an Afro-optimist, albeit a cautious one. I'm an advocate for Africa rising and we'll say more about the importance of the narrative um, later. In particular, I'm concerned about who creates narratives, who owns narratives, and who destroys narratives. The theme of this session is titled The Developmental State, and I must admit that I found this topic intellectually challenging. The description that I received linked this topic to political democracy, and personally, I think that democracy is a loaded and simplistic term to describe our socioeconomic opportunities and challenges. I also question the collective assumption that we share the same definition about democracy. It means different things to different people around the world. Accordingly, I beg your indulgence. My development practitioner view is that fundamentally, poverty is the root of all problems and getting development right is a key solution. By extension, I believe that all African states have declared an interest in delivering development for their people. And my brief remarks will share my perspective on salient issues and contradictions, successes and failures, opportunities and challenges. I will focus my remarks on three key points and look forward to a lively exchange of ideas and debate. The first point, all states have pursued and continue to pursue the development agenda. One of my favorite books that grounded the development economist in me in humility is titled Seeing Like a State, How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed by James C. Scott. This, and I quote, this book grew out of an intellectual detour that became so gripping that I decided to abandon my original itinerary altogether. Originally, I set out to understand why the state has always seemed to be the enemy of people who move around, to put it crudely. In the context of Southeast Asia, this promised to be a fruitful way of addressing the perennial tensions between mobile, slash and ban hill peoples on one hand and wet rice valley kingdoms on the other. The question, however, transcended regional geography. Nomads and pastoralists, such as Berbers and Bedouins, hunters, gatherers, gypsies, vagrants, homeless people, itinerants, runaway slaves, and serfs have always been a thorn in the side of states. Efforts to permanently settle these mobile peoples, sedentarization, seem to be a perennial state project. Perennial in part because it so seldom succeeded. The more I examined these efforts at sedentarization, the more I came to see them as a state's attempt to make a society legible to arrange the population in ways that simplify the classic state functions of taxation, conscription, and prevention of rebellion. Having begun to think in these terms, I began to see legibility as a central problem in statecraft. The pre-modern state was in many crucial respects partially blind. It knew precious little about its subjects, their wealth, their land holdings, and yields, their location, their very identity. It lacked anything like a detailed map of its terrain and its people, it lacked, for the most part, a measure, a metric, that would allow it to translate what it knew into a common standard necessary for synoptic view. As a result, its interventions were often crude and self-defeating. 
How did the state gradually get a handle on its subjects and the environment? Suddenly, processes as disparate as the creation of permanent last names, the standardization of weights and measures, the standardization of language and legal discourse, the design of cities, the organization of transportation, seemed comprehensible as attempts at legibility and simplification. In each case, officials took exceptionally complex, illegible, and local social practices, such as land tenure customs or naming customs, and created a standard grid whereby it could be centrally recorded and monitored. The organization of the natural world was no exception. Agriculture is, after all, a radical reorganization and simplification of flora to suit man's goals. Whatever their other purposes, the designs of scientific forestry and agriculture and the layouts of plantations, collective farms, Ujamaa villages, and strategic hamlets all seemed calculated to make the terrain, its products, and its workforce more legible and hence manipulable from above and from the center. These state simplifications, the basics given of modern statecraft, where I began to realize rather like abridged maps. They did not successfully represent the actual activity of the society they depicted, nor were they intended to. They represented only that slice of it that interested the official observer. They were moreover not just maps. Rather, they were maps that when allied with state power would enable much of the reality they depicted to be remade. Thus a state cadastral map created to designate taxable property holders does not merely describe a system of land tenure. It creates such a system through its ability to give its categories the force of law. This view of early modern statecraft is not particularly original. Suitably modified, however, it can provide a distinctive optic through which a number of huge development fiascos in poorer third world nations and Eastern Europe can be usefully viewed. But fiasco is too light-hearted a word for the disasters I have in mind. The Great Leap Forward in China, collectivization in Russia, and compulsory villagization in Tanzania, Mozambique, and Ethiopia are among the great human tragedies of the 20th century in terms of both lives lost and lives irretrievably disrupted at a less dramatic but far more common level, the history of the third world development is littered with the debris of huge agricultural schemes and new cities, think Brasilia or Chandigarh, that have failed their residents. It is not so difficult, alas, to understand why so many human lives have been destroyed by mobilized violence between ethnic groups, religious sects, or linguistic communities, but it is harder to grasp why so many well-intended schemes to improve the human condition have gone so tragically awry. And yet, as I make clear in examining scientific farming, industrial agriculture, and capitalist markets in general, large-scale capitalism is just as much an agency of homogenization, uniformity, grids, and heroic simplification as the state is, with the difference being that for capitalists, simplification must pay. A market necessarily reduces quality to quantity via the price mechanism and promotes standardization. In markets, money talks, not people. Today, global capitalism is perhaps the most powerful force of homogenization, whereas the state may in some instance be the defender of local difference and variety. And I stop there. So in essence, um, this is all from the book, but it just goes to show how difficult it is to manage states, and despite the best intentions, um, some of the challenges that uh, go hand in hand with trying to create standards and standard approaches in very diverse uh, communities and which um, results in, in failure more often than success. So with that introduction, what is the scorecard of Africa's strive for development post-independence? The consensus is that the political agenda was delivered. We have fewer coups than we used to have, uh, fewer cases of, of civil war than we used to have. Um, faster action is taken politically. Uh, unfortunately, the African Union finds itself spending most of its time um, on security issues rather than economic ones, and that's a trade-off. And so there's a broad consensus as well that the economic agenda has yet to be delivered. Africa lags behind the rest of the world in the World Economic Forum's annual global competitiveness report, so I have the joy of always having to uh, uh, discuss with my colleagues why we're at the bottom <laughs> uh, compared to the other continents and what we can do to, to raise uh, our positioning. And worse yet, uh, last year's Africa Competitiveness Report, an analytical review of the previous 10 years, revealed a steady decline in productivity in agriculture, manufacturing, and service sectors. Africa's share of global manufacturing has declined from 3% to 
between 1970 and 2013. That said, significant improvements in health and education um, have been, were registered uh, between say, 2005 and, and 2015. Um, as tracked by the Millenni Millennium Development Goals process. Um, nonetheless, everyone acknowledges that much more needs to be done in order to address poverty and uh, increasing inequality. After languishing at the back of the pack throughout the 1980s and 90s, Sub-Saharan Africa was second only to South Asia in terms of annual average HID growth, human development index growth in the 2000s and outstrip the Arab states, East Asia, Europe and Central Asia, and Latin America. So there is hope um, for progress. Africa is not behind the curve on everything. African states aspire, therefore, to raise their average GDP growth from about 5% to 10% by 2030 to 2050. It is estimated that this high economic growth needs investment rates of approximately 25% of their combined GDP consistently for 40 years. Increasingly, Africa is transforming from a continent in need of assistance to a continent of opportunity. Its economic growth is today second only to the East Asia region, which includes China. And Africa was home to eight of the world's 15 fastest growing economies between 2000 and 2013. The continent's GDP of more than $2 trillion in 2013 was larger than India's. And over the past decade and a half, Africa has demonstrated remarkable economic turnaround, growing two to three percentage points faster than global GDP. And this is why, personally, I'm an advocate for Africa Rising, which is looking at where we are today vis-a-vis uh, -vis where we were before and recognizing that the improvements in growth rates has been because of policy reforms that are finally translating into the results that we see. That does not mean that underlying challenges do not remain, but it's important to recognize where things are working and to see how to, to build on those successes. Investors around the world have taken notice. Private capital flows to Africa totaled $545 billion from uh, to th between 2003 and, and 2012, surpassing remittances and official aid. Africa offers a higher rate of return on FDI than most emerging economies, in sharp contrast to returns that foreign investors earned 20 years ago. Africa's trade ties with the world are expanding, although in general, um, Africa's percentage of global trade is, is less than 3%. So we have a long way to go. We've come some ways, but we have much further to go. I'd like to take a deep dive on a, on a country that's often cited as an example of a developmental state, and this is Rwanda. Rwanda's economic growth has averaged about 7% a year in the past 10 years. Maternal and child mortality has fallen by more than 60%, and near universal health insurance has been achieved. It's one of the safest and least corrupt countries in Africa. It has 64% um, female representation in parliament and is ranked sixth of 145 countries in the Global Gender Gap Index of 2015. In just the past three years, the percentage of people living in poverty this was up to 2014, dropped from 44.9% in 2011 to 39.1% in 2014. In terms of competitiveness, uh, Rwanda ranks among the top three um, most competitive economies um, in Africa, according to the Global Competitiveness Report. Now, why is this important? Because this is a country that had to rebuild itself over, 20, over a period of 20 years and just goes to demonstrate what is possible um, on the continent. And so despite the various views about how that is getting done, I think there's lessons there for the other countries about how they can improve, not just on the growth front, but also on the development front. And, and this is what we were discussing and countries were learning during the World Economic Forum and Africa meeting in Kigali last week. So as a footnote to this first point, it would be amiss of me not to comment on the constant references to following in the footsteps of the Asian tigers. Technically, I agree that there are lessons to be learned. Socially, I believe that we downplay the importance of the social fabric of the Asian countries, such as homogeneity of their cultures, centuries-old history, shared history, fundamental values and religious beliefs, as well as experience of colonialism that differ from the African countries they're typically compared to. My second point, there is no political freedom without economic growth. According to the Forum's Global Risks Report 2016, the top five global risks of highest concern for doing business within the next 10 years for Sub-Saharan Africa 
are one, 88% unemployment or underemployment. Two, it's 70% energy price shocks, either significant increases or decreases. Three, 55% failure of national governance, and in, by this we mean weak, real, weak rule of law, corruption, or political deadlock. Four, failure of critical infrastructure coming in at 45%, and five, fiscal crisis at 39%. I ask you a simple question. How long can love last without food on the table? There is a saying that a hungry man or woman is an angry woman or man, and civil strife across the continent is strewn with examples of the basic need that compels otherwise reasonable people into killing machines. There's a recent study that was conducted by the UNDP on um, radicalized uh, extremists, uh, violent extremists, terrorists basically, um, in, in Eastern Africa, and in tracking the, the history of these individuals, the, most of them turned to um, Al-Shabaab because of economics, not because of religion. And so increasingly, it's becoming apparent that we need to address the root causes as opposed to coming up with, with better weaponry or security interventions. Since yesterday, we've had good questions about what we mean by democracy. Is it processes or outcomes? With unbridled campaign financing, is the electoral process free and fair? Without mechanisms that continue to link the voted and their voters past the post-elections, who are the elected accountable to? When we talk about institutional reform, why don't we advocate for the reform of political parties when so many represent the power of the minority purporting to be the voice of the majority? So how many of our elected leaders truly have a national mandate? A renowned Nigerian social scientist, Claude Ake, coined the term the democratization of disempowerment. This means that democracy is a meaningless choice, particularly for the majority poor people who lack the ability to discern between the pools of candidates. Choices eventually come down to loyalty. Are you with us or not? Are you one of us or not? With no economic growth, people have nothing to choose from. And yesterday, I spent almost an hour watching a quite horrific uh, video produced by civil rights uh, activists in Kenya um, called the um, uh, unfinished, unfinished Business. I recommend you, you watch it on YouTube. But it just brings to light this aspect about loyalty. Um, as opposed to choice of candidates. You know, are you from my tribe or not? And if not, we will come and find you in your houses if you vote against us. And, and that just, um, it's terrifying if you think about how uh, the legitimacy of the leaders um, that we have uh, emerging from those processes. Can economic growth trigger political reform? Rwanda is a fascinating example of the change that's underway in Africa and the questions it provokes. As far as time limits are concerned, Rwanda citizens have voted for an extension, and this view needs to be respected if we value democratic processes and principles. We should equally be open to referendums where citizens vote for a shortening of a president's term in office. Fundamentally, there's a question of democracy for what and for whom. As a footnote to this particular point, I'd like to say something about non-state CSOs um, that are often cited as good checks and balance mechanisms for rogue states. Well, at least our political leaders are elected through flawed or flawless processes. What is the basis for the legitimacy of CSOs? Most lack financial, this is particularly NGOs, most lack financial independence, and one has to wonder which Pied Piper's tune they are dancing to. Personally, I believe that the pillar of civil society is important, and I believe that we need to rethink what constitutes legitimate civil society, as well as related roles and responsibilities. And very often, when you find civil society organizations being marginalized by government, the question is, you know, you can open your own NGO. What gives you the right to speak on behalf of millions of people um, in terms of picking positions? And this is the balance that um, leaders of countries particularly have to manage in terms of balancing everyone's interests um, particularly with the collective interest being at the forefront. My third and last point is that I think it is necessary to broaden the inclusivity agenda. And um, in particular, from a Pan-Africa basis, I, I would argue that we need to build on a greater collaboration and build on Africa's history of cooperative societies. We at the forum try to, to do this by seeking to foster multi-stakeholder collaboration um, in terms of designing solutions, sharing uh, insights, um, fostering trusting partnerships, and jointly executing to deliver results. 
and this is by combining the forces of, the, of government, business, and civil society. It's not easy, uh, but the underlying belief in that is that there are challenges that are too big for either of these stakeholder communities to manage on their own, and so what we try to foster is the, is the shared spaces where they can work um, together to uh, advance progress in critical areas. So, despite the, the decade of high growth that we saw in Africa, a big concern, at least for policymakers, is the failure of the, of the trickle-down effect. Um, and particularly when you take into account that most economic activity takes place in the informal sector, which accounts for more than half of Africa's GDP and employs more than 80% of Africans. As the working age population is set to double to 1 billion in the next 25 years, modernizing local economies will be vital to making the continent more competitive and to improve people's living standards. There's tremendous power in the unity of working together as one in ways that take into account the continent's diversity, data, and demographic opportunities and challenges. As many of, of you, at least the, the Africans here know, Africa is incredibly diverse in terms of culture, identity, and ultimately inherent values. There are approximately one billion people living in 54 countries across the continent. One third of these countries are landlocked and have small economies. Um, what Ibrahim likes to say, they're not economically viable, and, and in many cases that's true. They're heavily dependent on their neighbors, particularly those that uh, border the ports. It is estimated that there are more than 3,000 tribes in Africa, and on a religious basis, the primary adherents follow Christianity, Islam, or traditional African religions. Due to Africa's colonial history, there still exists a demarcation of at least four major language groups, namely Anglophone states, Francophone states, Lusophone states, and the Arab states, and Equatorial Guinea is the only country where Spanish is an official language. Now, this may seem trivial, but we saw these historical ties play out when it came to addressing the Ebola crisis. So who supported Liberia, who was asked to support Guinea, and who was asked to support Sierra Leone. So these are differences that, or traditions, or histories, or legacies, that we need to take into account as we talk about building an inclusive Africa agenda. Second, with respect to data, Africa faces a daunting data challenge, which makes it difficult to determine accurately interventions, to track progress, and to measure outcomes. In 2012, only 25 countries in sub-Saharan Africa had conducted at least two household surveys over the past decade to track monetary poverty. In many cases, the surveys are not comparable over time. So this is worrying because it means we're essentially guessing um, where people are and what the needs are and doing our best. And, and perhaps it's not so surprising that sometimes we are far off base when it comes to really tackling um, what is critical. The good news here is that mobile technology, big data, and data science are game changers and are presenting new opportunities to capture timely relevant data and analysis to address this um, gap. The UNECA, Economic Commission for Africa, also launched a data revolution last year, essentially gearing up to build the capacity of African national statistical offices. The third D I mentioned was demographics. With the world's largest youth population today, in 25 years, Africa's current working age population is expected to surpass both China and India. Africa remains overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly a rural continent, but its cities are a growing economic force. Today, 40% of the continent's 1 billion people live in cities, a proportion roughly comparable to China's population and higher than India's. By 2030, that share is projected to rise to 50%, and Africa's top 18 cities will have a combined GDP of $1.7 trillion. So why does this matter? In essence, these three Ds, is, and, and there are probably many, and I believe there are many others, just heightens the scale of the challenge with respect to how we need to combine forces to truly be able to uh, address Africa's development challenges in, in particular. Um, I had wanted to highlight some of the things that we're doing at the forum to address this, but that I'll just let you ask questions about that. And always, a lot of it is online anyway, um, so I won't uh, take up too much time with that. But the last footnote that I have for this third point is, fundamentally, the inclusivity agenda will only be met if citizens own and are vested in their national visions and development processes so that they can stand up and defend them because they believe that the, that is the trajectory they think that their country should take. Citizens need to demand for quality outcomes of state efforts, and, and Obi expressed this uh, very eloquently yesterday. In conclusion, 
back to the narrative that I mentioned at the outset. Um, storytelling matters, and the Victor story carries the day. Who is telling our stories? Who defines the contents of those stories? Who decides the point or purpose of those stories, including the audience? We need to own our imagination, rally each other to pursue our dreams, share success and failure so that we can continue to forge ahead. My last thoughts, Africa is a marathon, not a sprint. She's a journey worth taking for the courageous, not the faint-hearted, and the ultimate winners will be the just, not the mighty. Thank you very much for that extremely stimulating uh, speech. And I think that you've given us quite a bit to think about here. Um, I'll, I'll put up front that uh, Elsie and I see these things quite differently, but I think that there's quite a lot here for a very productive <laughs> conversation. So I'd like to say that when you were describing, you know, reading the uh, citations from uh, Scott and talking about the overbearing state, what came to my mind was the overbearing quality in modern times of the good governance agenda and the policy agendas coming from outside. So I'm wondering if you would comment on whether you see effective performance of African states today as requiring more policy space for African states or less policy space. Uh, should they be uh, more constrained by the international community, by international policy agendas, by conditionalities or do they need more policy space to experiment the way China has, to try things out, to see what works um, without uh, quite so much international interference? Yes. <laughs> no, I totally agree and that's increasingly what we're seeing um, as the, the states are coming of age. So with the increased growth and essentially seeing uh, more investments uh, taking place both from investors within the region and outside, what has happened is that it has um, expanded the economic freedom that states have um, in terms of who they then, um, who they can draw resources from. And so a shift that's taken place is seeing more policymakers paying more attention to what their citizens are asking of them. Um, and like previously where you had conditionalities that were imposed which led citizens to ask who policymakers were accountable to. Was it the providers of aid or was it the citizens for whom the aid was supposed to work? Um, having been in a situation where uh, working with the, with the Treasury in Tanzania where you would see how much time we would spend just producing reports for donors um, accounting for the money that they were providing vis-a-vis -vis the time available just to listen to uh, even other ministries, for example, to understand what their needs were and to do proper planning. Um, I think this shift in terms of the expansion of the policy space and more independence from the international community is a positive one. Um, equally true is that the shift will become much more real once governments also manage their taxes better and are more accountable as well for the services they deliver that generates taxes from their own people. And that's why you're seeing a big push now for domestic resource mobilization and a push on policymakers to take the right decisions and to implement uh, better policies that can help them generate more resources domestically. Okay, I'd like to press you a, a little bit on this idea that um, having uh, foreign direct investment creates more policy space, more economic freedom. Um, certainly, I think the experience of a lot of African countries has been the pressure to bring in foreign direct investment, in fact, creates huge constraints on policy space um, that uh, conditions uh, tax freedom, uh, keeping labor costs low, that often the, uh, the pressures and incentives necessary to bring in foreign direct investment actually create something that looks a lot more like a race to the bottom rather than policy space for development. I'm wondering if you'd comment on the extent to which the pressures to attract foreign direct investment uh, create uh, pressures on policy space rather than giving the kind of freedom that might be needed. I think investment is a good thing, right? And Africa needs uh, more investment, not less. Uh, the lessons that have been learned, though, is what are the terms of investment, what works and what doesn't. 
So over the past uh, two decades or so, there was heavy emphasis on investments in capital intensive industries, for example, mining. And with the assumption being made that once uh, sectors like the mining sectors took off, there would be a trickle down effect. 20 years later, we can see that that was actually not the best, uh, the best route to take. Um, a lot of the concessions that were offered did not fully translate into the benefits that the policymakers expected. Um, and just back to my, 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 my remarks about you know, this being a marathon is that policymakers also make mistakes, right? And how do we expand the space for experimentation um, with policies? Uh, what we try to do at the forum, for instance, is to encourage much more sharing of best practices and helping people not have to repeat the mistakes that their fellow uh, colleagues in other countries had to go through, uh, not just in Africa, but also countries elsewhere. And it's remarkable how little sharing takes place um, to help policymakers um, learn on the go, so to speak. Okay, um, to move into a, a slightly different area, you commented that imp there have been improvements in growth in Africa because of the policy reforms over the past few decades that are now bearing fruit. I'm wondering if you would comment on to what extent you think the decade of Africa rising was a product of policy reforms and to what extent of high commodity prices. And if uh, it was, in fact, a, a product of policy reforms, why are we seeing the beginnings of a serious slowing down of growth now that commodity prices are falling? Do you expect that Africa is going to continue rising over the next 10 years? And if so, what's necessary to make that happen? Thank you. Those are three questions. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see if I got them right. Um, one, in terms of the policies translating into the rising growth rates, um, the major emphasis was on macroeconomic policies, and, and in that regard, um, I think the track record is, is clear uh, in terms of, one, just allowing countries to be able to borrow from sovereign markets, uh, which has led to some of the challenges we're seeing happen now. Uh, but then equally, as uh, Obi raised yesterday, um, during the 2008-2009 global financial crisis, it was remarkable how fast African countries were able to bounce back and offer lessons to their counterparts um, globally. So in that respect, uh, a lot of countries learned about what to do um, to get things right. The, the challenge that we're facing now is that because there was no trickle-down effect, clearly microeconomic policies also need to kick in and to undertake the kind of reforms that will enable more people, or more citizens to participate um, in the growth agenda and therefore translate into development. Um, this is much tougher, and which is why you're hearing um, a lot of talk now about um, diversifying economies, moving away from dependence on, on, commodity, on commodities where countries are commodity rich. Um, it's very heartening, at least for me, to hear uh, people like the finance minister of Nigeria talk about how now that the gravy train's gone, there's actually an opportunity to undertake the difficult reforms that they were not able to when money was easily flowing in from the commodities. And that's the attitude right now, that this is an opportunity to take on uh, the difficult tasks, uh, collect taxes uh, much more uh, firmly and much more systematically. Um, which is painful for many people. If you're not paying for property tax and all of a sudden you have to and the government's very uh, s strongly pursues and follows up on that and is very firm, um, not everyone is accepting of that. But when you have no alternative, um, everyone needs to participate in contributing um, taxes. So looking, going forward, just based on the current commitments, I would say if we're able to... Um, make inroads in terms of uh, economic diversification. We have some examples. I mentioned uh, Rwanda that decided to pursue a knowledge economy. Um, you have Ethiopia that has, that has pursued a strong industrialization uh, policy. Um, and this has led to more countries thinking about how they can build their, or develop their industrial strategies, but more importantly, in a way that boosts small and medium enterprises and not just supports large-scale ones. So if that comes through, I'm, unfortunately I'm not a, a C, I can't see into the future, uh, but if they're able to sustain um, the current rhetoric and commitments that we're seeing at the moment, um, then we could succeed. Okay, I'd like to, to squeeze in one more question. I can see the time for this section. The session is almost over, but uh, one more question about 
the idea of resolving some of the revenue issues by raising taxes. Um, to what extent does it make sense to have a policy of addressing Africa's revenue issues through direct taxation in a context in which 77% of the labor force um, are vulnerable labor, in which um, on average something in the range of 60 to 70% of the population are below the poverty line. Should we not be thinking more about how to get taxes, in fact, from large-scale business, from trade? Stiglitz himself has said the most sensible play way to raise taxes in countries that are administratively constrained and poor is through trade taxes. Um, is there not scope for re opening up our thoughts about the tax agenda in raising revenue, given this, the structure of African economies and labor forces. I agree that we need to be much more creative about how we go about mobilizing uh, revenue. At the same time, for uh, citizens to have legitimacy and to hold their states accountable, they need to have skin in the game. So everyone needs to pay their taxes. The question is one of proportionality and also um, also ensuring that taxes that are received by the government are well spent um, and also deliver services to the people, then they won't mind paying it. And linked to that is also just making it easier to pay taxes. Uh, there's a recent study I saw where people complaining that they cannot spend hours queuing to pay taxes. So why can't the state go digital? They're willing to pay, you know, <laughs> I can see you <laughs> sort of wrinkling your frown, but they, they are, they are technology solutions now that make it easier for the state um, to go about its business in a way that does not impose a burden on its citizens. Okay, well, we have uh, how much time now for Q&A from... Okay, we have time for maybe one round of questions from the, the wider public. Um, I've seen a question here. Let me take one from here, one from here, and one from here. Yeah? Um, three questions. Please keep them tight. Cut to the question right away, and we will uh, be able then to hear the three and answer them. So we have this, uh, is it a woman over here? This gentleman here who has a mic, and this gentleman here. Okay. Uh, quick, quick comment and a question. The first comment is a disagreement. We've disagreed in pri private yes. over the issue of term limits. Yes. I like Paul Kagame very much. And I think uh, there are a few others whom I like. But I think the moment we start shifting the goalposts for individuals, we, we will lose the plot. And, and I, I don't have to give examples across the continent where le leaders have become entrenched in power for 40 years plus. Okay, please cut to your question. Yes. Okay, so that's the first one. Sec second issue is really, what has the World Economic Forum done for Africa? Yeah. Okay, that's succinct. <laughs> okay, we're going to take three in a row, so you can ruminate on that one. Uh, this uh, young woman over here. Um, good afternoon. I. I realize that you brought up the example of Rwanda several times with regards to how well it is performing. I'd like to find out how much of it do you think is due to its size? Because you're looking at a population that's estimated, I think, around 10 million people, which is roughly the size of the capital of its neighbor, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which also has 10, 10 million people just in Kinshasa. So how much do you think of this um, advancements is due to the, the ability to manage, manage a micro-state which they can regulate very easily, as opposed to the giant states that, are, that exist in Africa. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your um, talk. I found it really interesting that you talked about how colonialist legacies like, um, were a problem to inclusivity and there were quite deep set cultural differences. I wanted to know whether you thought that the cultural differences exacerbate the lack of economic prosperity or the lack of economic prosperity exacerbates the cultural like, intolerances? Okay. Just writing that down to make sure I get it right. Sure, yes. So, um, I'll kick off with the last question because I think it's, uh, it's the shortest. And I'd say it's, it's both. Uh, 
right? Um, and that's the short answer. Um, depending on the, on the context, um, cultural intolerances can also hinder um, economic prosperity. And one example is just allowing women to participate um, in, in the uh, economy. And where countries embrace that more and recognize um, women's role more, then you see greater economic prosperity. Where that is curtailed, um, then you see less progress. And then um, equally true is that um, where you have challenges, a lack of economic prosperity is, for example, um, the UNDP study uh, of, of the terrorists and what the backgrounds are is an example of um, culturally intolerant behavior arising from, um, from challenge, economic challenges, basically. <coughs> Um, why Rwanda? It's a good, good question, and the reason I cited um, Rwanda more, it could have been Ethiopia, I think two other countries that are often cited as developmental states are, um, uh, this is Botswana and, and Mauritius, is a case in point, and I think you make a valid point about the size, but at the same time, a lot of the efficiencies um, that they have managed to, uh, to bring about, and given the fact that they're a landlocked country, also demonstrate what is possible um, with focused leadership and visionary leadership, and which is a lesson to everyone, right? Um, regardless of the size. So the, what has WEF done for Africa? I can speak about what I've done, <laughs> uh, what's happened uh, under my watch. Um, our fl we have a number of projects and initiatives that are ongoing. Um, the forum does not provide funds and neither are we an implementing organization. We essentially, uh, help our partners work together and align their efforts um, for co-investment or to co-intervene, as the case may be. Um, so in agriculture, we have a flagship initiative called Grow Africa, which was launched in Cape Town in 2011. Uh, we have over seven countries that are participating. Um, this was conducted in collaboration with the African Union, the NEPAD agency, and was looking to accelerate um, private investment in agriculture. And, and as of uh, last year or to date, over $2 billion of private capital has been invested. And um, over 6.5 million smallholder farmers um, have benefited directly or indirectly. The design of the uh, partnership framework was very much to ensure that smallholders were transformed in terms of increasing their incomes as well as boosting their productivity. Uh, but by doing that, by leveraging um, large capital, both uh, from the continent as well as from outside and working hand in hand with the, with the governments. In infrastructure, again, we collaborated with the African Union, uh, the NEPAD agency and the African Development Bank to see how we could uh, translate the 51 transnational uh, programs that were they were looking for investment for um, and bring that down uh, to a much more manageable number in terms by applying how the private sector assesses uh, bankability of projects. It took us about three years. We've handed over the toolkit. The secretariat is now managed directly by the NEPAD agency, and they're replicating the process um, that we used for all other projects that they have. And right now, we're now looking at um, developing a hub to direct um, blended finance or building a blended finance uh, initiative, which was launched in Addis last year during the Financing for Development uh, conference. And the idea with blended finance is how to pull together different sources of capital. So be it uh, public sector funds, private sector, but private sector broadly defined, not just investment banks, but also insurance companies, um, and also leveraging um, aid money uh, to take on different responsibilities. And the objective of creating this hub is that if you have your infrastructure project, instead of you knocking around, you know, knocking all over the world on different doors, to get to financial close, you can actually get on a call once a month and have all the key players on the call and, and be able to take that offline uh, in terms of um, who working, identifying who, can, who would be interested in collaborating around that transaction. So that saves time. And the aspiration there is that over a five year period, we'll be able to um, get the one, at least $100 billion of capital channeled from those with the capital, and they have the capital right now, into actual projects. This is a global platform, not an Africa platform. So we're working with the key stakeholders to see how we can uh, establish a pipeline. We have other projects in health, in <laughs> responsible mineral development, uh, water management. Um, what am I missing? 
skills development, um, happy to go on and on, but uh, we're doing quite a bit in the different areas to see how we can help um, the different stakeholders move forward faster. Thank you very much. Um, in the spirit of the, the, the talk that Elsie has just given, I, I would like to, you to go away with the thought not only about how civil society could better hold its states to account, but how it could better hold the private sector, especially the international private sector, to account. Um, but I would like to thank Elsie for her very stimulating uh, talk, and uh, I hope that you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um,